Hey everyone, thanks for listening to the Coffee and Pens podcast. I've got John Parker with me today. We're going to talk about his books, about book cover design and his community, the indie space. John, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty well, man. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Uh, can you introduce yourself a little bit, please? Yeah, absolutely. My name is John. Um, I am an author, an indie author. I've published three books. I've written more than that. Um, and I intend on having a 100 book backlist before I am. Oh, gone and dead. That's my goal. Anyway, I'm a father. I have four kids. I'm married to my wife since we were 17. Love God, love family, love writing. That's pretty much the basics. All right. Thank you. Um, yes, sir. A small question. Do you also love coffee? I absolutely love coffee. This is my third cup in the last two hours. The last two hours. What do you drink? This is a Euro roast. And between us, there is almond milk creamer in there. Though you can't tell that to self-improvement Twitter. Because black coffee only. No, I do love black coffee. I drink it mostly black, but on Saturdays, I have some cream in it. Yeah, why well, not? You know, you have to treat yourself well, you know. Um, so exactly. three books, three published books. Uh, where do you get inspiration for each book? I don't know exactly. From the ether. <laughs> um, <laughs> the first book is called Mouth Breather. I always heard that, that, uh, in, that used as an insult, that term mouth breather. Um, but... I always have sinus issues. So a lot of time I have to breathe through my mouth. So I was like, I'm not an idiot just because I have allergies. And uh, but anyway, <laughs> um, I thought about this, this story and I just thought that was a cool title. It's about a kid who does that. He just gets lost in his mind and thinking about things. He's intelligent, but he always finds his, like he's just slack jawed, I guess. Um, and he gets made fun of for it and he gets bullied. And from that little concept came the rest of the novel. Um, where he deals with no father, his uncle's MIA in the Middle East. He deals with suicide. He deals with an active attack at his school. He deals with all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, budding teen romance, um, defending himself, all kinds of cool stuff, in my opinion, in the book. The idea for Toxic, which is a book for, um, it's a self-improvement book for men. And yes, it was hinging on the idea of toxic masculinity because I think it's BS. It basically came from that. My perspective on what it, toxic masculinity actually is and in my opinion it's not what modern society says it is um and then the last book is a christian sci-fi it's the first in a christian sci-fi trilogy because i really wanted to write a zombie trilogy um and it has people with superpowers and there's like robot armies and angels and demons and and jesus <laughs> i just thought it was cool and i have sometimes ideas just randomly hit me i don't know why or how and I just write them down and I've got a bunch of them in my phone and I'm going to write them. Interesting. A lot of your inspiration comes from within from what you experience or what you think about. I would say so. So in Mouth Breather, I never dealt like I didn't have a, somebody shoot up my school, thank God. But a lot of the other stuff, a lot of the emotional things, uh, those are real emotions that I can draw from. So a lot of my inspiration, a lot of the content just comes from my own feelings, I guess, if that makes sense. Yeah. A Christian sci-fi, did I get that right? Is that something you've read before? Is that something you came up with? I didn't know it was a real thing. <laughs> um, I actually didn't peg it. I didn't label it as Christian sci-fi right away. Okay. Um, I've gone through some ups and downs with my faith uh, over my life, just like everybody does and whatever their faith is. But I came to this point where mouth breather doesn't mention God. It's not a bad story and it has good values and morals in it, I think. But there's no direct mention of God or Christianity. Toxic does mention it, but it's, a, it's kind of peripheral. And I just, as I grow, as I grew, or as I am growing, I, I, during that time when I was writing the sacred, I realized that if I believe something, then I should live like it's true and I should write like it's true, you know, like, so I, I want to, I believe God is real. So I want to include him in, in my stories. And I think there's a whole market that there is actually a whole market for Christian fiction, sci-fi fantasy, all kinds of stuff that I didn't even know existed. And I want to break into that and I want to write stories in that space. And I think it's a really cool area to be in. I didn't start calling it Christian, Christian science fiction until I got a negative review on Amazon. Somebody gave me a one star and they said, this should something along the lines of this should be labeled as cry-fi instead of sci-fi. And I was like, well, that's kind of a compliment. That's awesome. But you're, it's Christian. Like, I'm happy that 
my faith is evident, I guess, in the story, because that's what I wanted. I want the characters to have good morals and values, and I want them, they're not all Christian, but I want them, my heroes are, you know, because I think that's a good faith. I think it's the, 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 right, the right one. Um, not that this is what that's about, but, you know, that's important to me in my writing that I honor my faith. So I did. And I just thought it was funny that a negative review, actually it, that, that review felt good to me. And I'm not going to, I'm never, if I had the option to remove it, I wouldn't, even if it is a one star, because it's awesome. Every review is feedback, you know, whether it's positive yes. or negative. Absolutely. What do you think was the biggest challenge writing your first book? Um, I think it was just, I just didn't have any idea what I was doing. I mentioned before when this was reversed that I I used, I used to just get a notebook and try to write out my stories by pen, uh, pen and paper. And like I stopped, like I did, I always failed because my fingers hurt too much and I, or I would run out of paper and it was just irritating me and I couldn't just go back and edit what I did because I'd have to rip out whole pieces of paper and it was very frustrating. Um, I never learned like all the stuff. I just wanted to write, right? Uh, I didn't know there was all of these different things I should have learned beforehand. So the struggle was learning everything about how to be an author while like trying to do it. So every, I felt like every step forward, I was taking a half step back and it took me way longer to finish that book than it should have, should have. And it took me way longer to learn what I know now. It's been, I published that book in, I think 2017. And I've only, like there are some authors out there that are so prolific that they've written 60 books in that time. And I've written well, I've written more than three, but I've only published three. I've written, like, I think, six. But anyway, that, that's the that was the biggest struggle trying to trying to write the book and learn how to write books and learn how to publish and be an author all at the same time. If I could go back, I would have spent a lot of time, like Adam Lane Smith did. He, I've heard him talk about this. He spent several years learning how to be an author, and then he started writing. Kind of like what you're doing with what you've done with your you're learning everything you can about nonfiction writing. Um, and you know all this information now, and now you're in a good place to, to move forward uh, with writing. So I wish I'd done that. So um, that's one of the lessons that you've learned along the way. Are there any other lessons that you learned moving from first book to the second to the third? I've learned a lot of stuff. I've learned the importance of networking with other writers. I've learned that you can read every book in the world about writing, and you're still going to not do it. You're still not going to do it the same way that that those books do it. I've learned, what I mean is with that, I've learned the importance of giving, giving yourself grace in the area, in this area. I used to beat myself up like, this author says I need to do this, this exact way to be, you know, to do it right. Um, and I used to beat myself up when I wasn't doing it that way. I don't know why, but um, I didn't. And I learned that giving yourself grace and allowing for mistakes and being willing to keep an open mind and to build your own process off of the foundation of the processes <laughs> of, of what you've learned from other writers is, is very important. I learned that not all books have to be a certain word count. You shouldn't start writing with the goal of, I want to write a, a 100,000 word book, right? You should start writing your book and have the word count that you think it will be, but don't fill the book just to get to that word count. My second book is, I don't even remember how many words it is. It's, I'm pretty sure it's under 30,000 words. It is a nonfiction uh, self-improvement book. At first I was like, in my head, I thought this needs to be 50,000 words, the length of a short novel, like a, a regular length novel. I guess that a 50,000 words is a short novel. That's about what mouth breather is, but it just didn't happen. And for a while I tried, like, how do I beef this book up? Not the point, like, don't beef a book up. You just put in, if it's nonfiction, put in the information that's useful and helpful and that will benefit the reader. Readers would, I learned that readers would much rather read a 10,000 book, a 10,000 word book that is full of easily, or that is full of actionable and advice that they can begin implementing and begin improving upon their, their process or their work or their life or whatever the book is about. They'd rather read that short book then, you know, feel like they got their money's worth with a hundred thousand word book that is just fluff and just repeats itself over and over again. I wanted to pick up on the book length. People that most care about the book length are your publishers anyway. And they've got two outdated ideas about that. So first is that people want more value for their money. But actually, 
um, you get less value for your money because if you read a hundred thousand word books, you pay in money and you pay in time. It's going to take a lot longer to get the, the knowledge. Secondly, the books tended to, or used to be sold in bookstores. So you wanted a big side, like a big book, so you could put big letters on the side so people could, would notice. But um, bookstores are a thing of, unfortunately, the past, so it doesn't matter too much anymore. If you're buying your book online, no one cares how, how thick your book is or like how much space there is for uh, the letters on the side, right? So um, like you said, John, don't worry about that book length. Um, next question then, is there anything that you continued doing? like while writing the first book, the second book, and the third book, something that worked so well that you continue doing it? I think my process completely changed from book one to, I keep wanting to go off on the ones I've written, but let's just stick to the ones that I've published. So for the first three, it changed. Mouth Breather was completely pantsed. I pantsed my way all the way through, which means if, for those who don't know, I didn't outline anything at all. There, That is apparent. I'm pretty sure there's still a plot hole in there that I didn't like, I haven't gone back and changed and it happens. I'm, I'm the type of person who I want to get the work out there, even if it's not perfect, because if, you know, just like everybody knows, if you try to wait till it's perfect, you're never going to put it out there. So there's a, there are some issues in that book that I didn't know were there until after the fact, but Hey, it's published someday. I might go back and change it, but I'm not doing that right now. But from that, I pants my way all the way through it. Um, toxic nonfiction book. So it's, it's not, you don't outline it in the same way anyway, as you would a fiction book, but I didn't outline that either. I did outline sacred and I did, and I, and I outlined savage also, which I'm about halfway done with. But so that, that changed. But the thing that, how do I say that? Something that stayed the same was my willingness to, or my, my willingness to let my current creative inspiration overtake the outline, I guess. So in mouth breather, there was no outline, so I didn't have to worry about it. But I'm a believer that whatever the outline says, it's good. The outline is good to give your creative potential parameters, uh, barriers, so that you're just not all potential. You know what I mean? So that you're targeting your potential in a certain direction. But when I'm writing, a lot of times, something better comes into my head while I'm writing, you know? So that's something I think that has stayed the same across the books I published and not published yet they will be published is the willingness to let the in the moment creative inspiration guide me more than what i wrote down in my notebook you know weeks or months ago about what i thought would be good then so that's something i always tell people i don't think it's good to stick to the outline just for the sake of sticking to the outline if something better comes your way do that because ultimately everybody will be happier with a better story right yeah of course do you use a certain framework to write your outline? When I started outlining, I was using Adam Smith's Write Like a Beast uh, Deluxe, his course, his program. And I still have it and I still love it. And I recommend it to everybody. But actually, there's a pretty cool discount on it for members of my group. But anyway, uh, um, his how he outlines is simple and easily, easily, easily implemented. And it's effective. And when I'm outlining on my computer, I follow it to a T. I do exactly what he does. But I also, I find that I prefer more often than not to outline, if I'm going to outline, to outline in my, in my author journal, in my notebook. And basically, <clears throat> it's a child of that system. It's very simple. I write down prologue and a paragraph about what's going to happen in chapter one and a paragraph about what's going to happen. And that's it. That's my whole entire outline. And I do that on the right on the right side of the <laughs> on the right side of the notebook and on the left side of the notebook um the, so the back side of the other page i write important notes uh, i write people's names i write for my um sci-fi trilogy there's people's superpowers are there the villains names are there the everybody's names are there a little bit about their past their descriptors their whatever important words important concepts um i have a whole leveling system not where they level up like in Pokemon or I guess that's evolving, whatever. Anyway, um, but there's, I've tiered the superpowers according to levels one through five. I'm a nerd, but whatever, that's what I've done there. And so on the right side of my notebook is the outline short paragraphs about what's going to happen in that chapter. And on the left side is all just important information that I might need to refer back to uh, at some point in the writing process. That's amazing. That seems very useful. Are there any other writing tips you have? Someone's just starting on their first book. What do you tell them? 
I would say, stop it, get help. No, I'm just kidding. That's a Michael Jordan meme. I don't know what's wrong with me. Anyway, uh, um, I would say take it slow. Don't don't rush just because you want to get a book out there. Take a learn learn a lesson from Kiel and spend the time learning what you need to learn before you begin the process because it's better to learn and become an, as close to an expert as you can. You don't have to be the best in the world in this arena, but the more you learn, the better your story is going to be, the better your ultimately, the better your sales are going to be. And the more people are going to like you, the more people are going to want to read your stuff. Also, highly, highly recommend documenting the process. So share your daily word counts, share photos. Like I, it's on hold right now, but I'm working on an entire fantasy epic fantasy series it's like a nine book series i share the maps that i've drawn like i made actually the maps in it incarnate.com for people who like to do world building and building maps which i love a lot but i used to just draw them by hand and that's really cathartic and like therapeutic and really fun for me but i share those photos i scan them share them on twitter facebook instagram whatever you whatever you're on um and i've been thinking about actually sharing more of that stuff but document it document everything you're doing like uh download and like i just got the hemingway editor to try that out i got that on gumroad when i've tried that out i'm gonna i'm gonna document i'm gonna say hey this you know whatever I, this editor's cool or this editor sucks or whatever I, although i've heard nothing but good things so i'm pretty sure it's gonna be good document everything it's a great way to build your audience in advance to let them know what to expect from you and to kind of build build hype you know as it were around the project that you're working on share your cover photo share your idea concept share your character information share everything People love it. People love to be engrossed in, in the world that you're building because I don't know, it's cool. It's cool that I just think it's, it's just cool. The people that have the ability to, to, to come up with all this stuff. It's just awesome. And other people love that. There's no shortage. Let's see. How do I say this? There are a ton of books in the world. People fly through books though. Like they, they tear through them. They read books insanely quickly. There's not enough books in the world to satisfy all the readers in the world. So my next, my, my next tip, I guess, would be don't worry about, about like adding too much. Like, don't worry about not having interest because people will be interested because there's not enough of these kinds of things, if that makes sense. There are whole podcasts just on world building. That blows my mind. I mean, I love it, but that blows my mind that there's audi there are audiences large enough to warrant podcasts about building false, like, imaginary worlds. That's crazy. That's crazy. So document, learn what you need to learn before you start and keep learning. Always be willing to keep learning and improve your process. Network, I guess would be a good tip. Network with other writers. Andy Space. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, network with other writers and ask questions. Learn everything you can. Ask them you know, what's that font on your cover? Like, how do I, how do I do that? How did you, who's your art? Who's your cover artist? Who, who edited your book? How do you, do you edit your own books? How do you do that? In fact, I'm writing an entire book just on this stuff. <laughs> um, I think I talked about earlier, giving yourself grace, do that. But also grace is not an excuse to not do anything or to, or to be lazy. Right. So Give yourself forgiveness when you don't meet your goals, but also remember, if you don't meet your goals, you're never going to get like what you're wanting. You're never going to get your book published. You're never going to be successful. If whatever your definition of success is, you're not going to get there if you're not writing. So define, I would say, define what success is for you. You can share that on social media too. Um, find out if you want to write because you want to make a living or you want to write to fulfill your artistic desires, or if you want to write to inform, uh, to teach, to educate. Find out why you want to write and keep that in mind. And, and then when you're writing your book, if you come to a, a point where you, like, you, it happens to me sometimes, like, why am I writing this? You'll remember, write it, like, write down your purpose for doing it. And just look at that. Like, put it in the first page of your author journal. Get an author journal. That's a good tip. <laughs> write it in the first page of your author journal. This is why I write. Because I want to entertain people. Because I want to share my faith. Or because I really like writing about, I really like thinking about dragons and I want to describe them with words or whatever your reason is. It doesn't have to be some grand overarching thing. I'm writing because I like writing, whatever. Just remember your purpose so that when you're slogging through something and you're like, why am I even doing this? You can look back and remember, oh, there's a, there's a purpose. Like, and then that purpose will help guide you on your journey. If you are slogging through something and you look back in your author journal and you wrote, 
I like, I, I'm writing. I want to write books because I really enjoy writing and I really enjoy like building worlds, for instance, in fantasy. And you're slogging through it. That means you're not enjoying it. And that means you might be going the wrong direction with your writing. And, and uh, so use it as a course correction tool also, I guess. Correct course constantly because you will end up way off course if you don't. There's a good tip too. <laughs> I think some of these are applicable to more than just writing. Yeah, for sure. Um, thank you. Those are amazing tips. Um, so we've talked a lot about writing so far. And you mentioned that you learned many things yourself with your first book. And one of the things that you learned, I guess, is cover design. Can you talk a bit about that process? I love cover design. It is something I didn't think I would really be into, but I started making my own book covers right from the beginning, which is part of that whole process I talked about learning about things I should have learned beforehand. Um, but now I've gotten to the point where I'm taking on clients to do book covers um, because I learned a skill over the last few years that I started doing for myself, but it developed into this paying gig on several occasions. So I wrote a post about it on my blog, um, how to create an awesome book cover. I think that was the name of it. It's really simple. It talks about the concepts as opposed to the technicalities. I don't talk a lot about the technical side of it because number one, it's boring. Number two, um, if you want to design your own book covers or book covers for somebody else, you've got to learn the program that you're going to be using. So I use Photoshop. You're going to have to spend a couple of weeks at least learning the very basics of it. So imagine yourself spending 50 hours just, just making random stuff on Photoshop, just toying around, not including tutorials, right? So watch, watch Adobe Photoshop. Let's use that as an example because that's what I use. Tutorials. Watch tutorials. Do what they say. You think there'd be something cool uh, that you can do on Photoshop? Google, like, how do I create this effect in Photoshop? Or just, just start randomly watching Photoshop tutorials. It doesn't matter. You got to start somewhere. Photoshop for beginners on YouTube. It's all free. There's so much free information. You can go on places like Skillshare if you want to. And there's really good training and videos on there. But it's all free on YouTube. There are tons of experts on YouTube teaching you how to do graphic design and how to... Um, from everything from how to download free fonts, how to place those, how to create cool effects, um, how to place the blurb on the back, what that should look like, how to write the blurb, which that's a totally different thing, but it is important for cover design. Anyway, so there's a few things that um, would be helpful to keep in mind when it comes to, like if you wanted to create your own book cover. Um, number one, make sure it looks like the covers in your genre. So if you're writing, I always use the, for some reason, I don't even write military sci-fi, but I always end up using that example. If you're writing military sci-fi and you, then you want your cover to look like it belongs in that genre. That means use the fonts that you see on the covers of other military sci-fi. You can easily go onto Amazon, go into that genre and subgenre and look at the covers. And if your book, if your cover, when you're done with it, looks like it belongs on that page, then you did something right from the font to the color schemes placement of your name your author name and placement of the title make it look like it belongs in that genre because sometimes there are books that have different covers that still break out but it's like actually i heard a good analogy when i was listening to six figure author podcast you could invest in day trading you could be a day trader right and that is investing in what you think is hot and what's going to stand out in that moment that's having the cover that stands out on amazon's top 100 bestsellers list or whatever or you can invest in the index fund and you can have a you could that that is equivalent to having a book that fits in to your genre and you could get a sustainable income does that make sense that makes sense that makes sense right so make make sure your book looks like it belongs there you don't want to have like flowy fonts if it is a military book because it's jarring and if it doesn't look like it belongs there readers are not going to buy it. They're not going to pick it up because that's not what they're looking for. And that's important too, when you think about both writing and your cover design is the tropes. People expect tropes. Some of us read like all kinds of different stuff. I read a lot of different stuff. My favorite thing to read is epic fantasy. There are certain covers. If it doesn't look like it's an epic fantasy book and I'm looking for epic fantasy, I'm not going to read it because it's not scratching the itch, I guess, if that makes sense. It's not fulfilling the desire that I'm trying to fulfill dragons dudes on horses with mountains and castles and stuff those are pretty golden when it comes to epic fantasy you know it tells me that that's probably what i'm looking for 
Something else is a good that's good to remember is fonts. I know I just mentioned those, but you can get a ton of those for free. And I recommend if you find a font on Amazon's or Barnes and Noble or whatever bookstore you're looking at, you find a book with a font that you think would look good on yours, but you don't have that font. Just reach out to that author. We've talked about that. Just reach out to them and say, Hey, do you know what font that is on your cover? And they'll say, yes, it's this or no, my cover designer did this. And they can point you in the direction of the cover designer and you can ask them. People are not generally a-holes. They are, uh, you know, they want to help or they're willing to help. I'm willing to help. If you find a font that you like on my book cover, ask me what it is and I'll tell you. <laughs> um, there are several things. And I think that's the most important when it comes to wanting to sell books is to make sure it looks like the other books that are like it so that you are reaching the readers that you want to reach. You don't want to reach people who don't want to read your book because then you'll get negative reviews and piss people off. Yeah, that's perfect. That's a perfect way to do some effort to help that want to reach people that don't want to read your book. And then um, let's move on to a different topic and talk about the indie space. The indie space is John's writing community where he works with fiction and nonfiction authors. They share ideas, but John is better at explaining everything than, than I am. So let's uh, hand it over to you. <laughs> okay. Um, the indie space is a project that I love very much. It actually... The idea came about from my wife telling me that because I was talking about joining this other group and she said, why don't you just believe in yourself and start your own group? And basically she told me I have a lot to offer and she's a sweet woman. And I was like, word. And, and uh, I was like, that's a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? I just, I can start my own author group. And, and I did, it's called the Indie Space. Inside the Indie Space are a lot of things. There's uh, what I call monthly care packages. Every month, as for as long as members are members, they will get a free training or guide on something. The first one, which will come to members' inbox as soon as they sign up, is the Modern Twitter Marketing Guide. And I put that there because most of the authors I talk to are on Twitter. And I, um, I want to help them increase uh, their Twitter audience because if they're on Twitter, they're obviously trying to do something there. So with the Modern Twitter Marketing Guide, that comes in your inbox as soon as you sign up, and that will obviously help you with your Twitter marketing. Another thing that you get right away is the publish and market like a pro author workbook. And that's something I created. It's free for all members. It's right there. You can actually get it for free also if you want to sign up for the newsletter, but either way. So every month you get a free guide related to online business, marketing, mindset, something that will help you improve your life. Other than that, there are monthly challenges. This month, the challenge is to just write a short story, right? They're not challenges that are going to kill you. That The challenge this month is to write a short story and it can be a nonfiction short story. I did that because it's in time with what else we're working on as a community. And that's this uh, sci-fi detective anthology, an anthology of short stories. And uh, I'm really excited about it. I'm having a lot of fun writing my own short story called Expand. But anyway, that's what we're doing as a community. We're doing anthologies. We're doing challenges. We're doing, we have accountability for each other. So we just, um, uh, we just started writing our writing goals, writing our writing goals. Uh, we put down our writing goals for the next one month, six months, and one year at least three in each of those areas. And we're sharing those with each other. And then in one month, we're going to update our one month goals. In six months, we're going to update those and so on. And that way we're remaining accountable to each other uh, and to ourselves. And there's also spaces for, we share our daily word counts, our daily word counts and our overall word count. Uh, we have a tracker for that too, or a space to track that. Beyond that, there's, like I said earlier, exclusive writing or exclusive deals for writers which I think is really cool. Uh, Gail offered us a sweet deal on Coffee and Pins magazine. Beautiful magazine, by the way. I don't know if I mentioned that, but I like it a lot. But there's that there, and there's, there's other stuff. There's uh, feedback, editing help. I can help with book covers, feedback on writing, and anything to do with the writing process. The community is there so that we can all help each other and grow and learn together to increase our prolificness. I don't know that, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> increase the amount that we write and increase the quality with which we write. And that, that was my goal. I just love hanging out with other writers, honestly. And all the other stuff is really just a bonus for me. Yeah, that's beautiful. It's a nice way of scratching your own itch and then scratching many other itches at the same time. Yes. How big is your community right now? There are about 25 people in there. 25. So how What's can that? people join? The easiest way to do it is to go to the indiespace.com 
there's a link on the homepage that will take you to the sign up page. There's also a way, a, a link at the top where you can read the blog. I guess that's another feature of the group that I didn't talk about. The blog is solely for members of the indie space to write on. So everybody in the, in the, in the community can publish on that platform, which is a cool feature for new writers who haven't published anything before they can start um, just talking about writing or marketing or something related to writing. That's what the, the theme of the blog is. They can just start that and get their voice out there. And then also new writers have the opportunity to submit entries for the anthology. So for anybody who wants to be a writer, but hasn't done so yet or has done so yet, whatever. Anyway, anybody who's in there can submit an entry <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. Um, but there's also, you can sign up for the newsletter there and get that free workbook and then just stay up to date. If you don't, you know, if you're not into it right now, but want to see what, where this community goes in the future, that'd be the best way to do that is to be on the sign up on the newsletter. But yeah, the, there's a link on the homepage that will take you to the sign up page. All right. Perfect. Thank you very much, John. Um, is there anything I did not ask, but should have asked? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> You didn't ask me any dad jokes, so... Okay, let's, let's hear one. Let's hear one. You've got four kids. <laughs> All right. So I used to date this girl. She was cross-eyed. Do you know any cross-eyed girls? Uh, no. Well, that's good. I had to break up with her because we can never see eye to eye. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, Plus, I'm pretty sure she was seeing somebody on the side. <laughs> yeah, got it, got it. That's a dad Go joke. On. I mean, no offense, people. Let's let that be clear. So, John, um, final question. What is your secret? My secret? Mm-hmm. Buffalo sauce. <laughs> I don't know. I don't really, I don't think I have one. Um, I just love writing a lot. And I just want to just want to write forever. Maybe that's it. Optimism. The fact that I think I can continue writing forever. That's my secret. <laughs> yeah. Optimism. Nice way to end. Right. Um, so where can people find out more about you apart from the indie space? I'm on Twitter at a blue gorilla. I know that has nothing to do with in the indie space or anything else, but I had this concept of blue gorilla publishing. So I thought that was cool. Anyway, um, Instagram, author, John Parker. I also have a Twitter at author, John Parker. So nobody else took that handle, but that's where I'm most active is Twitter at a blue gorilla. Um, or you can check out the blog author, John Parker.com. You can get mouth breather for free by signing up for that newsletter. And I post there about mindset, self-improvement, addiction, also writing everything. Pretty much that blog is just my way of getting what's in my mind out. Whereas the Indie Space blog is all about writing. But, and I brought up, anyway, authorjohnparker.com. There's a contact page. If you want to just shoot me an email there, you can do that too. With any questions, anything at all. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, Absolutely. It was a pleasure talking to you. A lot of interesting stuff here. Let's talk again soon.